It's a good thing we're Presbyterian and no one sits at the front or this would become really awkward. <laughs> well, let me ask you guys a question. If, let's say, you sit down for breakfast and you've decided you're going to have jam on toast and you get the jam jar out and you've got to open the jam jar, but you can't open it because it's on too tight, what do you do? You ask an adult, that's right. Or let's say you're driving down the road towards Manukau Mall and you see the rainbow in the sky. Not an actual rainbow, but rainbow's end. You know the rainbow's end sign? You know, you see that sitting in the sky and you really want to go. What do you do? You ask someone, don't you? You ask your mum and dad. You say, hey, mum, can I go to Rainbow's End? And she says, no. And you go, oh. But if you've got a jam jar and you run to dad and you say, dad, you're real tough and strong. Can you open my jam jar? He just grabs it and goes, pop, doesn't he? Not a problem. Easy as, just undoes it instantly and gives it back to you. Because your dad is strong and he's able to help you and he wants to help you. And today, we're going to be looking at prayer. And prayer is a little bit like this. In fact, it's basically exactly the same. But instead of running to our earthly mum and dad, we run to our Father in heaven. And we run to him and we say, Father, I need some help. Can you help me out with something? And just like because your earthly father is strong and able to open a jam jar, your Father in heaven is completely strong. He can do anything and everything. So we go to him and we say, Father, I'm just, I'm just really scared right now. Can you help me? And he says, yes. And you don't need to do anything. You just stand there. And like that jar that pops open, the Father comes along and he helps you. And so in our passage today, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul is going to tell us to pray. To pray. Because when we're faced with difficulties, we have a Father who loves us and wants to help us. So let's do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us. And like our earthly parents who come along and open up jam jars and give us things that we want. Lord, we just thank you that you look after us and give us the things we need. Lord, we pray for these children and we ask that you would help them to pray to you and to know that they have a Father in heaven who loves them and who loves to answer their prayers. Lord, would you help us as a church to gather around these wee ones, to put our arms around them, to nurture them and to care for them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, the reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Um, that's page 830 in the Church Bible. Um, I'm going to be reading from the ESV version, so your version might vary slightly. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belts of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, <coughs> praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an, am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. May the Lord bless this reading of his word. Well, good morning, everybody. 
wonderful to be with you again. If you want to turn with your Bibles back to the book of Ephesians, as was read for us earlier, we are back in Ephesians 6, and our text for this morning is just verse 18 through to 20, which I'll read again. So Ephesians 6, starting at verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which... I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. Father, we just look to you this morning, and we come before you and we ask that you would excite in our hearts a love for your word. We ask, Father, that as we look at this passage, that none of us would leave with a burden for prayer, but, Lord, we would leave with a passion and a joy to pray. Lord, we thank you for your free and gospel, which allows us to see all these things in its right way. Help us with softened hearts by your Spirit to believe what you say. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I wonder if you've ever heard a Muslim call to prayer before, either in person or maybe on a video. Part of my postgraduate study, we were looking into Islam, and part of our studies, we had to go to a mosque at the main time for the call of prayer, We had to sit there while they did the call of prayer, and we had to sit there while they came, and we watched all the people come in and do their prayers, and then we had a time of discussion with them afterwards. And it's incredible how how threatening it was to sit and listen to this call to prayer in person when you're right there. And... The interesting thing is the actual words themselves that they say are not threatening, but because you're not used to it, it's very jarring, of course, and you have all these associations in your mind. But this is how the Muslims call you to come and pray. Well, what Paul has done here is effectively called us to come and pray. If you remember the last two sections, the last two sermons from Ephesians, we've been looking at the spiritual war, haven't we? And we've seen the armor which we've been provided with for the battle. And we've seen that this battle is a reality and we need the strength of his might in order to stand. And now finally, as Paul begins to come to the end of his letter to the Ephesians, as he thinks in his mind of this war that they're engaged in and the reality of persecution and the reality of what they face day to day. After he's told them they're dressed for battle, they're ready to stand and fight, provided with God's perfect armor in Jesus Christ. And as I sat here reading this, I wondered, what would I have written after that? What would I have said? Would I have said, you know, now that you've got the armor on, go to battle. Fight the fight. What would you have said? And yet the interesting thing is, Paul doesn't say fight. Paul doesn't say charge. Paul doesn't say attack. He says pray. Effectively, having having put on the armor, having done all of these things, what I really want you to do is pray. I want you to stop and pray. You've got to appreciate 
the context of hearing this in light of the whole book. Throughout the whole book, there's been this, this undercurrent of the reality of the opposing forces that we face, the reality of who we are in Jesus Christ, and it flows all the way through right to the very end. And Paul says, effectively, because you are in Christ, you're dressed in the armor of God, and because you're in Christ and dressed in the armor of God, you have but one thing to do. Cry out to your Father in heaven. And these are the very things that Jesus said to his disciples on the night he was betrayed, on the night he was to go out to Gethsemane. He says things to his disciples like, you know, it's good that I'm going because you will no longer need me to ask things for you, but instead you will ask your Father in heaven for things and he will answer you and he will give you what you ask for. This is the way Jesus talked to his disciples as he got ready to depart. Because he knew the reality is that we are weak, broken individuals. In our strength, we cannot bear this armor and charge out to battle and attempt to do anything. Even though we are dressed in the armor of God, we are called to just simply stand and pray to our Father in heaven, the giver of good gifts. Paul wants us to pray, and he tells us firstly how to pray, and then he tells us who we should pray for. It's very simple what he does. Have a look at verse 18. He says, praying at all times. Now, when he says praying at all times, this may be surprising, but he means praying at all times. I know, shocking. He doesn't mean praying sometimes. He doesn't mean, you know, when crisis hits, pray. He doesn't say when things are going well, pray. He says just pray all the time. And I think this is what makes this passage really, really challenging for us. It's If it was changed just a fraction, it would be a lot easier for us to sort of accept if it read like this, praying sometimes in the Spirit with some types of prayer and supplication. To that that end, when you can, keep alert with some perseverance, making, you know, some supplication for some of the saints. If it read like that, we would readily be like, well, yeah, I can do that, can't I? That's, you know, I can pray sometimes and I can do some stuff. And, but Paul says, pray all the time, always, in every situation. And this is something that comes out of almost all of Paul's letters, time and time and time again. He's either praying for someone or telling someone to pray. When you're at work and you're faced with difficulties, pray. When you don't know what to do with your child, whether he's 36 or three months old, pray. When you're in conflict with your husband or your wife, pray. At all times, in all situations, through all things, cry out to your Father in heaven. It's fascinating, isn't it? That prayer is the most basic thing to do. Yet it carries with it the most incredible power where Jesus says, my father will hear you and answer your prayers. And yet we don't do it. We get caught into thinking that you know, this, is, this isn't really important enough for me to pray to God for. I can, I, can, I can sort this one out. How many of us have thought that before? I can sort this problem out. Never ends well. Every time I've thought I can sort this out, it's almost always been butchered by myself. And yet there is our Father, like with the children, 
standing there, happy to help, ready to do what needs to be done. But we don't ask. So we're told you receive not because you ask not. But he doesn't just want us to pray at all times. He wants us to pray in the Spirit. Now, if you've ever heard this verse abused before, it normally goes something like this. To pray in the Spirit means to pray in tongues or to pray in a spirit language which no one can understand. Now, I spent a period of time of my studies at a college which was very big on this type of stuff. And we would have prayer days. And during those prayer days, you would sit in a group with a few people and two or th one person would be praying and two or three others would be praying in this spiritual language at the same time. And the heritage I grew up from made me very uncomfortable when this happened. And I didn't know what to do with it. And what, what do you do with it? Because then they point to this verse and say, well, see, Paul says to pray in the spirit. And that's what this means. But when you consider that statement, pray in the spirit, in relation to the whole book, when we've been seeing that we're to do everything in Christ, day in and day out, we're to be this in Christ, we're changed in Christ, we're blessed in Christ, we're to walk in Christ, and over and over again, this language keeps coming out. Do this in Christ. You are in Christ. So when he says, pray in the Spirit, it would seem really weird for him to shift to that idea to it's some spiritual thing that no one understands. That jump is just doesn't make sense. So what he's talking about, if you understand it the same way as Paul uses in Christ throughout the entire book, is you're to pray linked into the Spirit as the one who has authority over your life, praying for the things that he would want, praying through the authority that he carries. So in the same way that when we have access to the Father in Christ and we walk in not in our own authority, but we walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, when we come to the Father to pray at all times, we come with the authority of the Holy Spirit himself. And we ask for the things that the Holy Spirit wants. So what does this immediately nullify? Father, can I have a new car? Father, can I have a million dollars? Father, can I have a mansion? Father, can I be successful? Father, make me cooler than everybody else at school. Why? Because when you pray in the Spirit, you are consumed with the things that the Spirit desires to see Jesus Christ glorified and manifested in this world. But he doesn't just say pray at all times and pray in the Spirit. He says pray with supplications. So what's the difference between supplication and prayer? Prayer is a word which is generic. You know, just pray, ask for stuff. It's a very general, broad category which covers every type of different prayer that you can make. Supplication is an intense pleading with a deity for something. So Paul is saying, don't just generally come and ask your father for things, but plead with him in the Holy Spirit for the needs of you and your people. It's like an intense pleading. This is not a casual, I'm sitting on my couch with my feet up, with a warm cup of tea in my favorite jersey type asking. This is an intense pleading, like you see David on his face as his child is dying, fasting, refusing food or water, and crying out to God that he might be merciful. It is that type of a prayer. But then he says, persevere. And be alert. To that end, verse 18, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Do not give up. Be ready. 
standing in your armor, dressed in the armor of Jesus Christ, pleading with God, ready to cry out for anything that's necessary, and persevering until the Lord answers your prayer. Do you feel the, the, the passion and the intensity of Paul here? You know, this is not just a flippant comment at the end of his letter where he's like, oh, by the way, you should pray. This is very intentional by the Apostle Paul. After saying everything he said, this is the note he strikes on as his final command. You must pray. And why must we pray? Because we can't do it. You know, it's a little bit like, like the Israelites fleeing Egypt. You remember that, that fateful moment where they get to the Red Sea and they stand before this vast body of water and they cry out and they say, wouldn't it have been better if we died in Egypt than died here in the wilderness? At least we had food and at least we were there was there not enough graves that you brought us out here, Moses? What is Moses' reply? Stand. Stand and see the deliverance of your God. He doesn't say fight. He doesn't say flee. He just says, just stand and watch what your God will do. And this is, this is what Paul is saying to us this morning. You're dressed you're ready. Now watch as God does everything. You don't need to strive. You don't need to fix the world. You can't save your loved one. You can't fix your child. You can't fix your work situation. You can't fix your marriage, but I can says the Lord. Pray. But who do we pray for? Firstly, we pray for all the saints, Paul tells us. End of verse 18. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance and making supplication for all the saints. Brothers and sisters, we must be praying for each other. Do you have a burden to pray for your brothers and sisters? Do you have people on your mind, saints, who need your prayer? I mean, were you overwhelmed by the amount of people with health issues that we had to pray for this morning? Did you hear that? One after another after another. And if we were to list every health problem, if we were to list every one of our relatives who doesn't know Jesus Christ, we would be here all day. So Paul says, pray for the saints. The saints at this time are being slaughtered for their faith. They're standing up under all sorts of suffering and atrocities. Pray for them. Cry out for them. Brothers and sisters, we have saints around this world in prison, being tortured, being mauled, being crucified because they love Jesus Christ. We have loved ones in hospitals suffering under the weight of the curse on this world. Will we pray for them? Will we lift them up before God, persevering day in and day out for them? This is our first chief area to pray for the brothers and sisters in Christ who need our prayer. But secondly, we're to pray for Paul. Verse 19, and also for me. Now, in Greek, me can be written in two ways. It can be written generally, like earlier, 
or it can be written emphatically, which is what it is here. Which is, so it's almost like saying, pray especially for me. So you've got to picture Paul at this point, chained to a Roman soldier, awaiting trial with the emperor. Fairly safe assumption he will die. Years drawing to an end. And he says, pray especially for me. But notice, notice what he prays for. He doesn't say, pray that I might be released. Pray that I might get to Spain. Pray that, pray that. He says, pray that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. So you got a picture of Paul focusing on Emperor Nero, one of the most heinous, cruel emperors who massacred Christians, and he's going to stand before him, and Paul isn't concerned with his physical health. He isn't concerned with his safety. He has one concern, that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would be boldly proclaimed. That all who stand while he is at his trial would hear of Jesus. And at this point you might say, well, why do we need to pray for Paul? He's been gone for 1,900 years or so. Brothers and sisters, we must preach that the gospel would be proclaimed. Whether it be a person standing in this pulpit, whether it be Peter as he wraps up his time, whether it be the next person who takes over, that whoever stands here would boldly proclaim the gospel. That you, in your workplace and in your school and with your friends and with your family, would shun even death to proclaim the gospel to them. That you would willingly have your family member say, I am sick and tired of you always telling me about Jesus. That we would be willing to bear any consequence to see the gospel proclaimed. That's what we must pray for. Why? Because just like we can't do it, our only hope is the gospel. The gospel will transform this world from top to bottom. It will change every aspect of it. It has the power to save sinners even like me. And it has the power to save you and the power to save all of those people out there. Will we be bold in proclaiming it? And will we be bold in praying that it would go forth? As the world tries to silence us, shut down our schools, close our preschools, throw our ministers in prison, will we cry out for strength not to live, but strength to proclaim? Oh, brothers and sisters, Paul was an ambassador in chains. He was a representative of Christ. And so he asked us to pray for him. You are representatives of Christ. Do you know that? Do you know that in Christ Jesus, you are a representative of him? Pray for each other. Pray that we would all boldly declare that gospel. That we may see men, women, children coming into this place and believing in Jesus Christ. You know, we can have every program under the sun. We can feed all the homeless people in Manurewa. We can do every good work under the sun. But if we don't preach the gospel, they're just as damned as they were before we met them. 
They need eternal security more than anything else. As a missionary once said to me, I'm not interested in sending fat orphans to hell. I want to feed the orphans, but I want to send them to Jesus. So I must do both. Brothers and sisters, Paul calls us to prayer. He calls us to prayer because in our own strength, we cannot win. So we must be like Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, where he sees a vast army of three kingdoms marching towards him. And he falls on his face before God and says, God, Yahweh, what, what am I to do? I, I can't beat this army. What will I do? Where will I go? What about your people? What about your name? What about your temple? And the Lord says, do not worry about them. Go forth and watch. You will not have to fight because I will fight for you. And the army marches out and Jehoshaphat puts the singers in the front row of his army. And they march to the enemy, praising God. And it says, when the singers started to sing, God caused confusion in the enemy camp and they massacred each other and ran home. And so the Israelite army walks over the hill and looks down and sees dead bodies, loot, weaponry, armor scattered everywhere. They didn't have to kill anyone. Why? Because God wins the victory. The spiritual war that we've looked at, God has won the victory. We just stand and pray and he does everything. Do you know how freeing that is? No more worry. No despair. Just hope. Because there is a father in heaven as I said to the children, who loves us. And like our earthly father, will come along and pop open the jar and do what we need. Amen. Let's pray. O oh, Father, our Father, we call on your name. We thank you. We thank you that we need not strive, we need not fight. We just need to pray. It is such a simple thing. We thank you for the words of Jesus Christ where your perfect son reminds us that you love to hear us and answer our prayers. Lord, would you help us to remember that? Would you help us to pray? Would you help us to be like Jesus, who in times of stress and times of strain would cry out to you in all of his pain? Father, would you hear our prayers? In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.